for coming. So today I'll talk about two kinds of uh, object, extremal combinatorial objects, uh, cacaea sets and cap sets. Okay, so the cap set is recent uh, breakthroughs on cap sets is, uh, is what uh, motivates uh, what giving you this talk right now. Mm -hmm. I can't really see. Okay. I don't know why I walked this far forward. <laughs> <laughs> is it better? Yeah, it's better. Can we can also pull up the blinds if you want to. So yeah, Prakas on cap sets is why I uh, thought it would be fun to give this talk uh, um, today. But I think I'll start with uh, some progress on Kakei assets, which has the same flavor in that it was like a famous problem, which will, uh, people were trying, um, famous people were trying very difficult analytic techniques. And then there was a remarkably simple resolution uh, using the polynomial method. Okay, so I'll start with Kakei assets, I think that's easier. And then cap sets also is elementary, but there is uh, certainly a uh, very creative use of the polynomial method. Okay, and please stop me. I don't want to assume any um, background. The only prerequisites really is linear algebra for this talk, more or less. So everything I say should be clear. So ask questions. Okay. So what's so first? Let's talk about Kakeya set. So what's the Kakeya set? So I don't know the uh, exact history of this, but you can find it in Wikipedia for sure. But it's it's it started in the basic question: What's the smallest area you can have of a set in a plane which has a line in every direction? Right. So so you can, you can of course take a circle uh, and it has a line in every direction, right? Um, uh, I should say of unit segment, okay? Otherwise you can shrink the circle. So what's the smallest area of uh, some uh, object in the 2D plane which has a line segment of uh, length one in every direction, right? So you could actually, um, so you can take a circle of diameter one. But the remarkable thing is uh, Besikovich proved in 1919, I think, that you can have sets of area going to zero which have a line in every unit segment in every direction. Okay. So you think that if you want a unit segment in each direction, you have to rotate it around, you more or less get a circle. It's pretty easy to you know, th do things like triangles and stuff and do better than the circle. But somehow you can recurse on that construction and construct sets of arbitrarily small area which has a, have a unit segment in every direction. Okay, and um, so that's that, but um, but it still turns out that the dimension of such a set is uh, is pretty large. So there is this famous conjecture, which is still open, that if you want to have a, a line segment of unit length in every direction in n-dimensional space, then somehow your Hausdorff dimension has to be at least n or something. Okay, so this is a conjecture which is still open. Uh, today we won't talk about anything about planes and continuous things. We'll talk about Kakeya sets. I have uh, that's not it's not important for the talk. <laughs> So that's the point, yeah. So we will go to Kakeya sets, but we will talk about Kakeya sets in FQ to the N. Okay, so what is FQ? So throughout this talk, F will denote a field. FQ is field with Q elements. All right. And N is going to be the dimension. And uh, here you want to think of Q as large. So that's going to be some one distinction, uh, N as small for the first part. Okay, so because we started with the plane, right, which is two-dimensional over reals, so let's think about um, you know two dimensions, three-dimensional objects over FQ. So you should think of this cube, FQ to the n this is FQ to the n. N is three here, right? And you want to have a line in every direction. Okay, so what's the line in direction? Some v uh, line in direction. Let's use v for direction, maybe. Is, is a set of the form a plus um, lambda times v for lambda in the field for some a in f q to the m. Okay, so it's the slope of the line. So line in some direction is uh, that slope. Okay, so the slope is an m n dimensional vector. Okay, so you want to have uh, a set, so a Kakeya set in f q to the n. Is a Kakeya set in FQ to the n is a subset, okay, which we'll call K, that has a line in every direction. Excuse me. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, no. Okay. Okay. So, what's the first part? Uh, 
So what does it say? It's a set which has a lot of structures in many different kinds of structures. So, so you would intuitively expect that a set like this has to be large, much like you sort of expected that to have a line in every initial, you know, every direction you need to be somewhat large. Okay. So that's what the Kakeya set uh, theorem showed. Um, so theorem which was shown in I believe 2008, I think, yeah. by, by Dwyer. Um, he showed, um, so people believe that this set has to be relatively large, right? So what's one trivial Kakeya set? Take the ev everything, right? So you can uh, do, you know, you can take Q to the N and, then the, and you can do a little bit better than that. I believe you can get something like Q to the N by 2 to the N, though, though I don't know the construction uh, offhand now. So if people expected this set should be large, uh, but the, you know, the best known bounds uh, were quite, uh, not quite there, but he proved that any Kakeya set uh, K in FQ to the N has size at least Q to the N, C N Q to the N for some constant. Okay. So there is some constant depending only on N, some positive constant such that uh, the set has to have almost all the points. And again, you should think of, yeah. Yeah, again, you should think of Q as large and N as small, so I'm not worried about this. Okay, and in fact, um, basically, you can take this to be um, size of K to be at least Q to the N by um, at least this. So, in fact, you can get something like this, Q to the N by N factorial. So, for the related, do you know anything about the related problem where you just enforce that the subset has to have two points that have like every pairwise distance? You know what I mean? Two point. Oh, like, so if the, you ask for a line, so it's like many points in this direction. Yeah, so yeah. Two points out. If you just want to make sure that in every direction it has three points, maybe? Or? Uh, uh, there, the, for, any, for any, you know, V, there exists two points whose different difference is V. I see. Uh, well, here, I see. So you just want, um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Good. Maybe any two points. Is it exactly the same? So I think this V and that 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 V
on K vanishes everywhere, then K is large. Okay, just for example, think of the you, you know uni, you know think of just univariate case, right? So you, if you have a bunch of points, you want to in one dimension, you want to prove they are large. If the set size is at most d, you can definitely find a non-zero polynomial of degree d, which vanishes exactly there. So if you prove that every degree d polynomial which vanishes on that set has to be identically zero, then that set better be bigger than. D. Okay, sort of too many. You know, that, that's, that's really the philosophy. Okay, is that reasonable? So, if a set was small, you can find a non zero polynomial which just vanishes on that set. And this might seem like a fact about polynomials, but it's really just linear algebra because, you know, polynomials form a linear space. So, if a set is small, you can find, um, you know, a non zero, you know, some non zero point vector which is zero in just these places. Okay, just a dimensionality argument. So it's just linear algebra, uh, but yeah, in this case for for uh, Dewitt's thing, the polynomial structure will be useful. Okay, so there are going to be two lemmas I'm going to prove. So in this spirit, I'll uh, prove uh, the following things. Okay, if a set if a set k has size, uh, let's see, I guess I want it to be strictly less than n plus d by d, uh, choose n, then there exists a non-zero polynomial f which is in fq it's an n variate polynomial degree of f is at most d and by degree i mean total degree okay so it's a multivariate polynomial so for each monomial is sum of the degrees take the maximum there is a non-zero polynomial so it shouldn't be identically zero that vanishes on Okay, and vanishes on k simply means f of a is 0 if a is in k. Okay. Again, uh, the n equals 1 case is what I just said. If a set has size less than d plus 1 or it has set at size at most d, then you can find a non-zero degree d polynomial which vanishes on this. Okay, and we will take d to be less, d should also be less than q here. So, okay, that's lemma one. And both lemmas are very short. So, and lemma two, if a non-zero f invariate of degree at most q minus one vanishes on a Kakeya set, then it vanishes everywhere. Then it's zero. So, uh, or I guess, let me just write it this way. So, a non-zero polynomial cannot vanish on a full Kakeya set. Or another way I'll write it, if, a, if, a, if f vanishes, of low degree vanishes on a Kakeya set, then in fact f is identically zero. Okay. Again, lemma one states that any small set you can find a non-zero polynomial, which vanishes just you know which vanishes on that set. Okay, so if you have some small set k, so let's take an arbitrary supposed Kakeya set. Right. So how do these two lemmas give us what we want? And it's exactly an instance of this philosophy, right? Because by the first lemma, if the set were small. I can find a non-zero polynomial which vanishes on this set. And in fact, you see why this q plus n, I'm going to instantiate this lemma with d equals q minus 1. Okay, if, so if my Kakeya set was smaller than this, n plus q plus n minus 1 choose n, I can find a non-zero polynomial which vanishes on that Kakeya set. But that contradicts lemma 2. Because by lemma 2, if you vanish on a Kakeya set and you have low degree, you must actually identically be 0. Lemma 1 is for any set. Lemma 2 is a Kakeya set. And you will see lemma 1 is really a dimensionality argument. Lemma 2 will use something about 
polynomials and lines. We have to bring in the fact that it's a Kakeya set. Questions? So I'll just prove lemma 1 and lemma 2 and we are done with Dewey's lower bound. Okay? Nice. All right. Okay, first lemma is very, you know, it's really just proof of lemma 1. It's just dimension counting. Okay. So we can, okay, so we want to find a non-zero polynomial of low degree which vanishes on this. So let me just define the space Fd to be F of low degree. Okay, so this is my space of polynomials. So I can have an evaluation, so I can have a map, right? So I can have a map which takes sigma, takes an arbitrary low degree polynomial and simply maps uh, so from this to let's say Fq to the k. Right, or sorry, you know, this. What does it do? It takes a polynomial and simply maps it to f of alpha, alpha in k. This vector. Okay, it's just an evaluation map. So the, again, okay, so I take the space of low degree polynomials. That's a linear space over fq. And I have this evaluation map which takes a polynomial and simply evaluates it at all points in Okay, so this map is linear, sigma is linear, right? And, uh, and if you just look at dimension, the dimension of the space here is size of k, of course, which is less than n plus d choose d. And now the only thing you need to observe to finish the proof is the dimension of this space. What is this? So what's a basis for low degree polynomials? It's simply all monomials. Okay, so, so the dimension of this is basically these tuples i1, i2 to in such that their sum is at most d. So again, this is a linear space. It is spanned by monomials x1 to the i1, x2 to the i2, xn to the in. Okay, so the number, you know, so the dimension of that space is exactly this and this is equal to, so it's the cardinality of the set which is of course n plus d choose d or n, doesn't matter. And now we are done, right? So you have a linear map from, um, uh, and the dimension here is bigger than this dimension here, so it should have a non-trivial kernel. So, the, you know, there must be a non-zero thing here which goes to zero. Okay? I mean, just a simple linear algebra, nothing more to it. Or it's an underdetermined system of linear equations. Uh, you have more unknowns than constraints, so you can find a non-zero solution. Good with that? Questions? Okay, so lemma one is done. Lemma two, let me prove it here, since I already have the lemma. Okay, so lemma two is, in some sense, the core of this argument. But it's reasonable to believe something like this should be true, right? So it's a, so it's a kake, you know, you have a polynomial which vanishes on the set. Now this set has entire lines in every direction. So if you take this polynomial f and you restrict it to a line, you will get a univariate polynomial. And uh, that's going to be a polynomial also of degree q minus 1, but now it's going to actually vanish. Okay, and, and that somehow intuitively says that this polynomial is vanishing in a lot of places and that's going to be bad. Okay, so you have to be slightly careful. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's some slight subtlety here, but uh, that's really the core. Okay, let's see. So let me try to erase this schematic and uh, let's do this. Okay, so now I'm going to write f and it's, uh, it's not 100% required, but it's convenient to write f in the following form. So let degree of uh, f be equal to d. Okay, so it's actually a degree d polynomial and d we know is at most q minus 1. I'm going to write f as a sum of different homogeneous parts. f0 plus f1 plus f2 plus fd. Okay, so fi is degree i homogeneous part of f. Okay, this might seem a little bit mysterious, but you will see once once you try to do the. What do you mean by homogeneous part of f? 
Okay, so f is a polynomial of degree d. So every monomial like this is going to have total degree something at between zero and d. So I take all the terms which have degree exactly i, bundle them together. They're fine. Okay, looks like a strange first step, you know, but it's not. You will see that if you try to do the proof, this you know it makes life a little bit easier. Okay, and I and I, of course I know f d is not equal to zero. Why? Because I assumed its degree is uh, d. And also note that d itself is not 0, and d is greater than 1, greater or equal to 1, because the polynomial, you know, is, is, you know, cannot be a constant. If it's the 0 polynomial, you have your conclusion, so it has to have some, okay, so I have d is at least 1, okay? Everyone good with this? Okay. Okay, now we are just going to really do the only thing we more or less can, it seems, which is that you have this polynomial, it vanishes everywhere. I'm going to take a line in some direction. So let's take a line in direction V. Okay. So this is going to be of the form A, some, maybe I should use underlining for vectors, but it's too late, so. so. A plus lambda v. So this is a line. This is L sub. Let's take a line. There's a line in some you know direction v for any v. Let's take. Let's fix an arbitrary v. There's a line in this direction for some a. Okay, you don't control a, but you know. But v can be anything of your choice. So of course you know f restricted to L sub v is zero as a function, right? It's because it, the Kake asset entirely contains this line, so f is going to contain uh, this. And here comes this one fact which is like, you know, very standard and used heavily in all sorts of use of polynomials in computer science, like the PCPs and coding and stuff like that. See, if I, because this line is like this, if I take a polynomial and write it in terms of this, you can write it as a function of just lambda because A and V are now fixed, right? So you can write this as, so let's call this a name G, right? So this is going to be some polynomial of T of is of degree d in t okay okay this is the one thing which if you have not seen before you have to sort of think about it maybe a little bit but really what you are doing you are saying x1 each of these variables you are substituting something a1 plus lambda v1 x2 is a2 plus lambda v2 and so on and so forth and the polynomial f is just obtained by just multiplying various monomials of this so you just, you know, you're taking this one to the i1, this to, this to the i2 and so on, you multiply it out, everything else is constants. So the only thing you will get is some polynomial in lambda. And its degree will be at most d because you know that when you summed up i1, i2 to in or i n, yeah, it's at most d. Okay, so this is a polynomial of degree d in t. Okay. On the other hand, so what's the, and this is a key, key place we will use this fact. So this is a polynomial of degree d yet it vanishes everywhere. You know, this, this, so on the other hand, g of t, or let me just say g of a is zero, not a, let me say g of mu is zero for all mu in the field. Right, because this line was entirely contained inside the Kakaya set, so for every value of mu, g of mu is zero. So you have a low degree polynomial, in, now it's down to one dimension, a line is one dimension. This is a univariate polynomial of degree d, d is at most q minus one, yet it has q zeros. Yeah. Kakaya set, if you take a line, all points in the line are in Yes, that's the definition. Yeah. So, a Kakaya set is that for any direction v, there is some a for which this entire set is contained in the Kakaya set. So, if you try to do what John was saying, so this point you will get a bit stuck. If you just, you need this, you at least need lots of points in this line to be there in the set. Okay, and indeed there are variants like of that which have been considered, which in fact are useful in pseudo-randomness extractors and so on, um, which is presumably why computer scientists start getting interested in these objects in the big. Okay, so these two things imply G is identically zero. Okay, is everyone with me? So you have a, on the line, you have a degree D polynomial, but it vanishes everywhere on the line. So, so the only way that can happen is if it's a zero polynomial. Okay, now we are almost there. Now all we have to really do is stare at this. What is g of t? Oh, I use lambda there and I move to t. 
okay let's use t then it doesn't matter okay or lambda is a field element t is an indeterminate maybe it wasn't inadvertently it was an okay choice so, so now this is f of what did i say a plus t v okay just think of it as a formal statement like this now look, we just have to understand what this looks like we just have to expand this out now on this side you have zero on this side it may look like some crazy uh, you know complicated uh, thing but actually if you look at so here is the one fact and again it's something you can just check or you can just squint hard enough you'll see it coefficient you can write this as some sort of polynomial right so it's a degree d polynomial so we can write this as h0 plus h1 times t plus h2 times t square plus hd times t to the d coefficient the fact is the coefficient of the t to the d term is particularly nice because if you want to get t to the d in every time you cannot pick the each of these terms you can pick either the a thing or the v thing if you want to get t to the d you have to pick the v thing every time because that's the highest degree term okay so the coefficient hd any guesses what it should be So every time you need to get, um, hey, best to do some example maybe, but yeah, it's simply F D of V. Again, why why F D? Because if you want T to the D, you have to take the highest degree terms. The rest cannot give you T to the D at all. And when you so F D is the only thing in play. On the other hand, when you do pick if you want to get t to the d, you have to be picking the, you will never use an a, you will only use a v. So really what you are doing is evaluating fd at v, that's all. Okay, and now we are done. So therefore fd is 0. This polynomial itself is 0. Okay, no, that's not quite true. I jumped again. So fd of v is 0, sorry. but really are done, right? Because V was arbitrary. So FD was this homogeneous part. I'll recap the whole thing just in, once I finish. So FD of V is zero, but V was arbitrary. Okay, there's a slight technicality that V cannot be all zeros, right? Because the direction cannot be all zeros. Uh, there are two fixes to this. Well, you know, this is a low degree polynomial. It cannot vanish on all but one point. If you want to, if you want to use Schwarzschild or those things, but in this case, it's even slicker than that. This is a homogeneous polynomial, so it will definitely vanish at the all zeros point. So, in fact, uh, v was arbitrary, and also f d of zero to the n is zero. So th these things imply f d is identically zero. Okay, contradiction. Okay. Again, two parts. Lemma one simply said that if your set was too small, I can find a non-zero polynomial which vanishes in that set. But lemma two said that, well, if you're a Kakeya set, the only option for you to vanish on this set is if you vanish everywhere. So the only way you could be a Kakeya set is if you're big. Because if you're not big, I can find somebody which only vanishes on you. And the lemma two is where all the algebra comes in a little bit, but it's very natural. Uh, you basically take, you know there is a line in every direction, you take a line in direction v, just restrict the polynomial to that line, it must vanish. And that basically tells you that the original polynomial itself vanishes in that direction. Okay, up to this homogeneous trick. So. That's it, I mean that's the full proof. Okay. So it was very nice, it's very short, self-contained, and gave nearly tight bounds. Yeah. Do you know what, uh, what type of Caesar bend? Yes, good question. Uh, so following this, people looked at uh, what Caesar bend is. So here Caesar bend was 1 over n factorial, right? So I think um, follow-ups which um, brought in the method of multiplicities to this, where instead of essentially saying you vanish on the Kakeya set, you vanish on the Kakeya set with high multiplicity. So using those things, I, uh, I believe you can improve uh, the lower bound to something like q to the n by 2 to the n plus little o of n or something. This is follow-ups. But I'm not 100% sure if, I think something like this was shown, but whether that's tight or not is not. And this is asymptotically better because 
n factorial is n to the n, this is true to the n. And, and so you don't know any upper bounds or construction? Really? I think this is close to the upper bound okay. also. Yeah. Second question, when this came out, were like common people just like, wow, we're idiots? Or like... <laughs> well, since I'm being recorded, I will <laughs> not answer the question. <laughs> No, but actually, you know, just to say, I think, um, okay, my, my, of course, a lot of arguments look simple in hindsight, right? So one should always be careful um, saying things. But my feeling here is that it was just, you know, like I never knew of the Kakeya set finite field problem when this came out, right? So I think maybe there was a mismatch between the people who really cared about this problem and the people who felt that taking lines in various directions are natural things to do, which is like, you know, most complexity theory people working in such things, right? So, so and I think you put the two together. It, it was very nice. Okay. Yeah, but you should ask actually one of the people who are working on this using other techniques. Okay, part one is done. How energetic are people? I've eaten like nine donuts. Okay. <laughs> so you're probably sleepy then. <laughs> so, okay, this is bad. Any questions about this before I erase this? No? All right. Yeah, and you can really, I mean, if you forget some part, you can look at the, the paper or, you know, there are various blog posts, you know, uh, Terry Tao has a post on this and various others. You know, you can refresh your memory anytime, so. So, so this doesn't say anything about John's Yeah, um, so there are extensions of this which say that if you have at least so many things on every line, and it's easy to imagine how you will prove that, right? Because you just need to, if you say that you have at least some P, you know, well, at least some L points in every line, you just pick this D to be L minus one. And the same thing, same sort of thing should work. Right, literally I think verbatim it should uh, work, right? Uh, yeah, because on the line you will have degree at more, less than L, but you will have L zero, so it will become zero, the whole thing will go through. Um, yeah, but if you just want to, maybe you can actually find some very small sets. Good question. All right, so now to cap sets. Okay, so a Kakeya set and cap sets are in some sense the exact opposites of each other. Okay, a Kakeya set has a line in every direction. A cap set has no line, not even three points on any line. Okay, so what's the cap set in F Q to the N? is a subset, let me call it C, oh, C, C looks like subset, so let me call it, that has no three points on a line, no three collinear points. Okay? So it's the exact, you know, in some sense the ex exact opposite, right? Kake I said had full lines in every direction. This one, there is no direction in which you can find a single line in which there are even three points. Why is it called the cap set? Uh, I thought about this <laughs> and I anticipated the question. I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, so I've never thought about it before when you wrote it down. I was just thinking if you asked that question in RN, the natural, I see. most natural set is the capital set. Yeah, yeah. I have so, no idea if that's correct or not. Yeah, I, I, I am pretty sure that must be the answer because, see, a lot of these questions um, have origins because people want to understand something about, you know, real geometry, right? For example, you can ask what's the largest something you can find on a sphere such that it doesn't, you know, have three points in a line or something like that. And largest volume set or something and maybe you take a cap on a sphere. And, uh, and people are asking finite field analogs of that. And wouldn't the entire sphere just work? Um, maybe, yeah. <laughs> so. Details. Details. <laughs> No, I, I'm sure some, there is some formulation for which you have to take a cap. Okay, okay. okay. And Mary is looking at her phone, so she can tell you uh, the answer. Also, also yeah. <laughs> These days it's easy, so you can have instant uh, answers. Okay, so it's the exact opposite. And I'll actually, and really the motivation for this actually comes from arithmetic, com, in additive combinatorics, arithmetic progressions and stuff. So this, I guess, really, yeah, in fact, I think that's the origin of this, not necessarily the, what I just said. We'll really focus on Q equals three. Um, and in, in the three, in this case, what does it mean? So if you have three points, and here again, it's opposite situation. Q small 
enlarged is the setting of interest. So the opposite of that. So that bound, you know, the Dewar's bound kind of becomes useless when uh, n starts growing, right? So whereas cap sets you typically study in the other regime, field is fixed, the so q is three, but n is large. Okay, let's take q is three. That's all I'm going to talk about. Everything I say will generalize verbatim for a larger q. Q is three is enough. Um, so in this case, uh, so if you take three points A, B, C, if they are in a line, so what does it mean? So, so you have point A, you have point B, you have point C, they are in a line. So that simply means that B minus A equals C minus B, right? Just three points, right? So, so it's F3, so line, so in this case it's actually having an entire line because there are only three points on a line. So when are A, B, C in a line? Well, the slope B minus A is equal to C minus B. Right? This is the midpoint. And that, what is that? That's basically saying A plus C is 2B. Again, if I'm consistent, just let me underline, start underlining for this part, just so that we keep sure these are all vectors. Okay. So if you So in this F3, it's a very nice property. So being free of lines is the same as free, being free of three term arithmetic progressions. Okay. And, uh, and there is these old problems in how many you know, numbers can you pick in 0 to n minus 1, which don't have three term arithmetic progressions, in the, you know, just usual numbers. Okay. And the answers for this is still um, not known, um, but there are some good bounds. So this is again the finite field analog of a number theoretic question. So the motivation for this comes from additive combinatorics. How large a set can you pick so that you don't have any three term arithmetic progression? Okay. Um, and then there's Roth's theorem, which said that such a set has to have uh, B of size little o of n, and then Samaradi proved it for not just three term arithmetic progressions, but for any length and so on. But here we'll just focus on this. Okay, and what do you want to prove here? So obviously this is an extremal combinatoric setting, so you want to avoid some configurations. So it's going to be hard to pick more and more points. So here you want to, you're seeking an upper bound. For Kakeya set, you wanted to show lower bound. Here you want to show an upper bound. You want to say that a set which avoids uh, all three term arithmetic progressions cannot be too large. Okay, so what kind of bounds can one prove? Um, by the way, so I, I should have looked it up, but again, so there exists such an S that is three term AP free of size. Okay, I forgot to look, look it up, so I will put 2.21 to the N to be safe. I think it's something like this too. So, so there, there is such a set. So that's the lower bound. So you can find a fair number of points. Two to the n is trivial. I was just going to comment that, but it's great. Yeah, two to the n is trivial because so, someone else see it because you can just use zero one to the n. So you can't have a line inside just zero one to the n inside zero one two to the n. Okay. All right. So so and you can do better than that. Is there a nice description of this? Uh, I, I I'm sure there is. I don't know. Yeah, I should have again one thing I should have looked up is how this construction goes. I didn't do that. Yeah. So okay. Upper bound, of course, you can place a trivial upper bound. Okay, it's not really an upper bound. Uh, so, but you can actually the best upper bound, I believe, best till best till less than two weeks back. No, less than a week back, I think. What what is less than one week back? Ah, it's just two weeks back. I don't know when. <laughs> the pace has been so rapid with people posting comments and PDFs and everything. I don't know when what happened, but you know, two weeks back. Um, so, it was something like this for some positive epsilon, okay. Um, but now, um, so new, uh, oh, I should write the names of these people, I guess, but, uh, okay, so, yeah, so it's really following Krut, Lev, Park, and then, so they, they did it for Z4, and then Ellenberg soon followed. And then there was one other person, 
his last name is complicated, uh, Gij Swit. Yeah. They independently extended it to F3. Okay, so let me just write all these names. Um, three term AP free set in F3 to the n has size at most. Ooh, I forgot to look up this number as well. Uh, uh, 2.756. Okay, let me give a little O of n just to be safe. Okay, that's it. Okay, so it's so it says that these sets have to be exponentially small. For the longest time, people were looking at, oh, it's 3 to the n divided by some small things. People couldn't even do n square. Right? But now this is a much, it actually says you have to be bounded away from 3 to the n. Okay? And I don't know, um, and I guess people weren't sure what the answer should be, whether the answer should be something like 3 to the n minus little o of n, like the upper bounds, or really something of the form a c to the n, where c is bounded away from 3. So now this resolves that question. OK, I'll try to. Take a one-minute break. Yes. I need to change that. Good. Okay, so let's try to do this. Okay. There's a very beautiful description of this in terms of three tensors in Terry Tao's block, and I really think that's maybe the correct way to write it in hindsight. And that way has also been useful to solve other things, sunflower conjecture and so on. But that seems very hard to just sort of discover directly. So let me stick with the polynomial um, method type intuition here. Uh, and then if, if people are interested, I can tell what the big combination is. Okay, so we want to prove that A is uh, kind of small. So, so the actual theorem is actually a very you know, explicit form. The size of A, okay, 3 to the n. And that most, so let me write, I'm going to introduce some notation here. Uh, so it's at most three times I, um, this quantity mn comma. So, so what do I mean by this? So this is basically the number of monomials. Uh, so I'm again, the polynomial method is going to come in. So you're going to have n variables because it's n. I don't really have to write my monomials here, but probably it's good. So when you have a monomial, but these are now polynomials over F3. Okay. So these exponents will go, can be either 0, 1 or 2. Because in F3, cube becomes equal to yourself. Right? So these exponents are all. So each of these ij's is in z3. Okay. And the number of monomials, I'm going to restrict. So m n comma 2 n by this first n just says the number of variables over f3. If you want, I can put m3 here just to say it's over f3. Okay. And then the second one is the total degree. So the summation, so i1 plus i2 plus i n is at most 2n by 3. That's the, the upper bound. <coughs> okay, is again the statement clear? So it's basically the dimension of a certain polynomial space. What space? Very natural. N variable polynomials over F3, total degree at most 2n over 3. What's the maximum degree possible here is like 2n. Everything can be 2. I'm saying you're only one third of the way there. And this set is exponentially small. Okay, and you can actually explicitly compute the rate of its growth, which is where this strange 2.756 comes in. It comes from some entropy function and so on. But let me not get into that calculation. We'll just say, why is it exponentially small? There are various ways to see it. Well, you have, in general, these numbers between 0, 1, and 2. If these ij's are picked randomly, the expected degree is what? Number n. Oh, n. N, yeah. Right? The expected degree is n because the expectation of each one of these is 1. So if you take a random monomial as expected degree n, so just by hafting bounds, the number of monomials with uh, total degree you know, 2n over 3 is exponentially small in n. So the number of these things is basically 3 to the n is the total number of monomials times some exponentially small thing in n. Right? So e to the minus some omega n is the size of this set. Okay, because this is just comes from Chernoff or half day. And it turns out you work out the best deviation, you get that. 
but it should be clear this gives you exponential things so let's just leave let's not get our hands dirty all right so very nice okay this is what we're going to prove any questions yeah, so yeah. I, didn't, I didn't completely follow okay so your argument was that random gives you so 3 to the n is the total number of monomials. Yeah. If you take a random one of those monomials, completely at random, how do you pick it? Well, you'll pick each of these i, I, I j's independently at random from 0, 1, 2. Sure. Now just compute what's the expected degree of such a monomial. Right. It's, n. it's n. And now you're saying, if you draw a monomial at random, what's the probability that your degree is only at most 2n over 3? So you're, you know, the expectation is n and you're at most 2n over 3. So you're this tail. And that tail is exponentially small. So, so you're, what you've written is less than or equal to 2n over 3. So yes. If you're random, oh, I see, I see, okay. 2n over 3 is less than n. <laughs> That's what I was saying. That's all you need. Yeah. <laughs> so 2n over 3 is less than or equal to n, and you get exponentially small, so the, the, it's an exponentially small set. Okay, that's it. So, okay, so now we have to prove this. Okay, where is all this thing coming from? So polynomials are going to come in. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, okay, so the crucial lemma is going to be this. Um, okay, I don't even have to say non zero polynomial. So under this assumption, okay. So the first set will again. I'm going to do the same structure as before. I will just use the assumption about the set size to say some sort of polynomials exist. Then in the second lemma, I'll bring in the arithmetic progressions. So the first lemma is true for any set of this size, at most this size. Okay. So the funny thing is, of course, here I want to prove. Uh, I have a upper bound on the set here. I um, yeah. So I want to prove this. So I'm going to say if you take a set of size bigger than this, I'll get a, I'll have the following. So if, so assume, so for everything else, let's assume there is a, con, I'm going to give a contradiction. So assume, okay, assume there's a three term AP free set of bigger than this thing, okay. So I, I so now I'm going to say there is a polynomial of degree at most 4 and over 3 that vanishes outside A and is non-zero on more than uh, okay, again what I have said here so I have a set if it's big enough let's say it's slightly bigger than this then, so this is the set A, it's somewhat big, there's a complement, it's still a tiny set, right, and my bound is sort of exponentially small, it's a tiny set, so but if it's reasonable size, then I can find a polynomial which is completely zero outside, but it's definitely non-zero, in fact, it's sort of nicely non-zero, inside, in fact, inside the set, it's non-zero on a lot of points. And that polynomial is degree 4 over 3, just twice this power. Statement clear? Then just keep this picture in mind. You have the set A here. I want a polynomial which vanishes everywhere outside this set. Okay, that's not such a big set because my A is reasonably sized, so that set is not too big. And it's non-zero, in fact, you know, sort of comfortably non-zero in the sense in the sense that on A it's actually going to be non-zero on many points. Um, so actually, um, so let me write the lemma in this way, for all b, subset of f3 to the n, size of b is at least that thing. Uh, there is a le outside b, and uh, okay, I'm just calling this b because later I'll apply this lemma with b being 2 times a. 
So I don't want to overload it. Okay, so lemma is simply purely doesn't have to do anything with arithmetic progressions. He says if you have a set which is somewhat large, there is a polynomial of low degree which vanishes outside that set and is non-zero comfortably inside the set. So this is sort of like the opposite of what we're doing in 